Hello everybody, my name is Jacek Bartoszak. Welcome to Strategy and Future. And today, uh, today's recording is, is being made from my uh, house in uh, Varmia and Mazury, which is uh, quite close to the Kaliningrad Oblast. And my guest, my special guest today is Dakota Wood. Hi, how are you? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. it's nice to, he to have you on my program. Uh, Dakota Wood is a senior research fellow at uh, Heritage in DC. Uh, he has uh, he he retired, uh, Lieutenant Colonel from the U.S. Marine Corps. He has an extensive and worth looking into extensive background to both in military and strategic circles in the United States and globally. Uh, the bio is really long. Uh, what uh, of course was of highest interest uh, to myself was that he also served in the Office of Net Assessment uh, in, the, in the Pentagon. And also, I'd like to touch upon this subject as well during our conversation. So thank you for uh, uh, well, accepting my invitation. And let me get started right away with what I have suggested right now. So, you know, Poland is right in the middle of uh, thinking about how to design its military, given the, um, you know, given the, what is obvious, war in Ukraine, pressure yeah. from Russia, when, you know, we don't we don't know what's going to happen. Eurasia competition, potential war with China of the United States. Different things may happen. So we we think what to choose, how to field, what how to shape the uh, the force. Right. And we have been very much concerned with how the Office of Net, Net Assessment operates in the United States. So give us a few you know, a few of your thoughts over overarching ideas what you find was uh, worth mentioning, how you, you know, from times where you were, worked uh, uh, in the Office of Net Assessment under Andy Marshall, uh, you know, and the um, Andrew Mayer was also there. Just give us some, mm -hmm. you know, insights so that, you know, the audience that is quite learned, give some, you know, have some sort of the uh, uh, feed for food, uh, food for think, thinking, you know. Yeah, I, I think there's been some unfortunate <laughs> evolution in the phrase, that assessment you know it's almost like just as people we find something good and then we want to so dissect it and define it and box it um, that it it starts to have less and less connection to its origins and this phrase net assessment um, it, it has kind of suffered that that same uh, uh, evolutionary tale there so the I mean if you talked with Mr. Marshall uh, he would say that even he had a hard time defining that assessment. You know, what is it? Is it a process? Is it a product? Uh, and in his view, it was it was really a way of thinking, right? That that in the net, you know, you're comparing one thing to another. Uh, well, how many variables might you be dealing with when you're talking about national defense or uh, national security uh, or some kind of a competition between, you know, Poland and a neighbor or the United States and the Soviet Union, you know, back in the day. Um, and so what he would try to do is, is say, let's pick an area of competition. There's a tech. Technological? Is it economic? Uh, is it a military uh, employment concept? And just kind of think through what the implications of that are and, and what factors may affect that particular issue. And so it was a mental approach to wanting to try to understand the variety of factors that would influence uh, the particular issue being researched. Now, now, there's a bit of discipline that has to come with that. Because the more you sit there and think about it, uh, you could add in just about anything you wanted and, and draw some kind of a connection, however tenuous, you know, between that thing that might be interesting and the actual question being researched. Um, so you know, the, the researcher or the analyst has to really reflect, I think, on a, on a regular basis about what's the focus and then what things might seem interesting but aren't really relevant. And, and really bring the thinking or the investigation back to the central theme. And he, he was also, Marshall was also very fond of saying that getting the question right is a really important piece. Otherwise, if you haven't clearly defined the particular question that you're wanting to address, then you can spend a great deal of time and energy and money and you know institutional effort uh, going down paths that really have no bearing on, on the central 
question. So getting the question right and trying to really uh, maintain focus on, on this particular line of inquiry that you're embarking on. And so this the Office of Net Assessment was established in 1973 uh, at the behest of James Schlesinger, who was Secretary of Defense at the time under uh, U.S. President uh, Richard Nixon. And Schlesinger uh, knew Andrew Marshall really well from their days together back in RAND, uh, which is almost the first think tank uh, in this terms uh, in the United States, was very focused on uh, you know grand nuclear deterrence theory questions and that sort of thing. And so Marshall was brought in because the administration had gotten very frustrated of uh, very poorly structured analytic efforts from the U.S. intelligence community and even from the Department of Defense, where you had uh, political agendas, you had um, uh, jealousies between different departments. Uh, a lot of that times it came down to who had the most influence with the president, who had the larger budget share, who was getting talented people. And so the office of the president and the office of the secretary of defense wanted an independent entity that could kind of stray into everybody's area, right? And pick up all sorts of information and try to distill that in a way that better explained the nature of an area of competition and how the opposing sides in this competition might behave in ways uh, where that analysis wasn't warped by imposing your own view on what you think the other side might be willing to do. And this happens all the time. Uh, let's say, you know, U.S. analysis of China. Uh, U.S. analysts would say, well, if I were China, I would behave a certain way with respect to Taiwan. Well, if you're thinking from an American perspective, you're not going to get Chinese thinking rights. You need to talk to people who really understand Chinese culture, the language, uh, the uh, political and social histories of that particular country to try to come at a problem from the Chinese perspective which is really, really difficult. And you'd mentioned the war in Ukraine. Everybody's trying to assess, well, what will Vladimir Putin do? Uh, how much pain is he willing to endure? You know, How will Russia react to the loss of their young men and whatever economic consequences might be coming from that? Well, if we apply a Western European view uh, to that problem, you're going to get it wrong, right? How do Russians think about you know, their previous era of empire, uh, Russian pride, uh, Russian views of ownership of certain uh, areas of land, you know, that we now define as Ukraine. But from a Russian perspective, maybe that's an oddity, right? And so this whole idea of net assessment was trying to get your mental arms around, you know, these various issues in a particular area of research. And I probably rambled on too long, but that that's kind of set the stage for what that office was all about. Yeah, that is very interesting. What struck me when I was uh, heavily reading a long time ago, the uh, the, the works of off-centered assessment and approaches was that, um, you know, by intuition, sometimes if you try to measure up to someone else and compete, you're trying to catch up on, you know, quantities. You you, you want to have the same number of tanks. You want to have, you know, the, the size. And right. Well, often in the works of people associated with of that assessment, I found this trace of seeking asymmetries and exploiting them, which uh, which, which seems obvious, <laughs> quite simple, but right. it's never but it's never easy in real bureaucracy. <laughs> In the you know common common thinking, we find it very difficult in Poland to to to, uh, to accept. And uh, while seeking asymmetries is much better way to defeat an enemy, you know, just use you, you found the advantage, some weakness, and exploit it. So um, that was uh, what 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 really was very um, informative. Yeah, and, and that's where Marshall was really looking at you know using the Cold War as a reference point. Um, the economic model was so different in the United States uh, in comparison to the Soviet model that, that Andrew Marshall and, and, and a lot of his colleagues felt that, you know, we could essentially outspend the Soviet Union. So the strategic uh, uh, what strategic defense initiative, Star Wars under uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, was meant to advertise that the United States would build a ballistic missile shield 
so effective, you know, space-based uh, sensors, yeah. weapons, and those sorts of things, that to defeat that, the Soviet Union would have have to invest great sums of money to try to match that capability or to defeat it. And the bet was that their economic model would not generate the wealth needed to push forward or sustain that sort of defense investment effort. Whereas free market principles and uh, in general, you know, a capitalist approach to this thing would always give uh, the Western world, Europe and the United States, an economic advantage, right? And that the freedom and the competitive nature and the innovation that came from the free market would give us the wealth um, that enabled us to make these investments in military capabilities. So though it was missile versus missile and missile defense against missile defense, and you had you know tank armies uh, stretched along the uh, inner German border, et cetera, right? The, the, the secret asymmetry there was the economic vitality of the systems in competition. And uh, the Soviet Union finally got to a point where they just couldn't keep up. You know, their, their people were stuck in long bread lines. Uh, they had lousy equipment because they kept cranking out things where the quality of control in their manufacturing facilities, you know, just wasn't where it needed to be at. And in the same sort of way, we could look at China. And some people have done this, you know, that in a more authoritarian model, can people exercise personal initiative? You know, can creativity come out of a very authoritarian or restrictive state and the same way that it can come from a liberal Western you know, democracy. So is that an asymmetry that gives you an advantage in coming up with solutions for problems that you might not even be aware are actually there until they manifest? And so this would be a, you know, another aspect of this asymmetry you're talking about. It, it, it can be technology against technology and you can't ignore that. You know, an airplane is going to have a certain radar cross-section, and a missile is either going to be able to find that or not. But the people behind those systems, can they exercise decision-making? Do they have the ability to make sure that the pilots or the crews firing a missile have enough training hours where they're actually competent in their job, right? Is the decision-making process so hierarchical that they just are unable to respond in a quickly enough, you know, manner, right, or effectively enough to actually deal with rapidly changing conditions on the battlefield. And we've seen some of these limitations play out in Ukraine with the failed efforts by the Russians, you know, in the early days. You know, their command and control structures just weren't working. So these are aspects of this asymmetry that you're talking about yeah. that are very, very important, but you really have to spend some time and effort digging into that material. And it's certainly, and we learned this at, at the Office of Net Assessment, that the classified world can be rather limited because a lot of the intelligence products that come out of that system are so um, uh, manip I say manipulated, but they're managed and massaged and they have to go through layers for approval before a report, you know, report is actually published. Where in the open source material, you've got journalists and businessmen and tourists and all this material uh, that it can just be found in, in open sources. And that also paints a picture and usually a much more accurate picture of the realities on the ground uh, uh, you know, with the competitor that you're trying to explore or whatever this area of technology or cultural exchange might be that's unfolding in real time. Yeah, I think this is a good segue uh, to move towards the uh, not only war in Ukraine, but also I'd like to, to, you know, to have your opinion on how do you see the evolution of the U.S. Army power projection, U.S. Armed Forces, United States power projection, and sustaining the, the primacy, the international system, yeah. uh, and the military that supports it, uh, and, you know, around 2030, and all those seven years before now and, and, and that time, given also what Andy Marshall was doing in terms of revolution, revolution military affairs, you know, and this is a sort of a mid question whether war in Ukraine proved the concept that it's you know the C2 and the precision that beats the mass. What do you think about it? And whether the United States will be moving towards that direction, enabling more of the allies in Eurasia mm. and coming from you know far away just to help them with enablers 
long range, reconnaissance, you know, in a different way that it used to be during the first, the second uh, or Cold War when it, it heavily stationed in, in, in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, trying to, you know, anchor the resolve and also demonstrate its own resolve and fall, form the alliance, shape the alliance in a proper way. It can do it probably in a different way. What do you think about it? It's a critically important, uh, critically important question for us here in Poland when we are going to uh, move with our uh, military doctrine and military uh, reform. You know, I think I think it's a crucial question to be answered. You know, especially in your context there, there in Poland. I mean, if we think back even to World War II, um, that was a war of mass. Uh, you know, the Germans came up with uh, Blitzkrieg and you know the Guderian. Uh, with, you know, marrying uh, fast-moving armored uh, columns and overhead aircraft and radios as communications and those sorts of things. But but Germany was, um, let's say, limited in its production capabilities if those production capabilities were damaged in any way. So when the United States got involved in that war, uh, almost no attacks on the homeland at all. The entire industrial capabilities of the U.S., could be bent to war production. And, you know, just the sheer number of people and tanks and airplanes and ships and munitions and all that stuff uh, carried the day because both sides, uh, all three sides, if you throw the Japanese in there as well, had some really innovative, creative individuals. And they were dramatically effective in the early stages of that war. But it really came down to who could sustain the effort uh, for a longer period of time. And the mass produced by the West, especially out of the United States, since Europe was so heavily damaged, uh, proved to be the war winning component to that. As we got into the Cold War, um, you know, the Soviet Union was right there on the European continent. So they didn't have to go very far to move material from one place to another. Whereas if the United States is going to be involved in some kind of a conflict, you're going to have to traverse the expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. And so it just seemed at that time for many years that the West couldn't match the capacity uh, for war in terms of tanks and airplanes and, and be able to replenish that in very quickly, uh, in very short order. And so there was this argument made for quality over quantity. And so again, the innovation of the West, uh, you know, better weapons, better sensors, uh, was intended to make the forces you had more effective in their application. And I think that aspect has really gone into the present day. So if you're uh, Ukraine and the Russians outnumber you four to one, at least, uh, just in population, and the Russians have the advantage being first movers, and they've damaged a lot of your power generating and production capacity, uh, you can't match Russia in quantity. And so you have to be able to fight smarter, you know, to make the things that you have much more effective. So now we introduce precision guided munitions, right? And so instead of volume of fire, if I can take a, a single missile and it hits precisely the target that I want to take out, you know, command and control facility and ammunition supply point, whatever that might be, that can have a uh, an overarching effect you know, that greatly extends beyond the singularity of that particular munition. You know, I didn't have to use 100,000 artillery rounds. I can use 10 uh, precision-guided munitions. So there's this qualitative aspect to warfare where technologies, you know, the harnessing of artificial intelligence, uh, deep data mining, uh, relational databases of information that a computer can make sense of the unfolding reality of a battlefield much much faster and probably more accurate than a human could if you had a room full of 30 and, analysts. And fit in you know, the OODA loop, that is, will be swifter. It does. Yeah, it does. You know, and you're leveraging space-based capabilities. So there's just a huge technological component. I mean, look at the rise. You guys are tracking this very closely of unmanned systems. Yeah. You know, it seems that everybody has a quadcopter or some kind of unmanned drone uh, that can provide imagery, communications relays, delivering of ordnance, all that stuff. And so it dramatically expands the ability of a smaller military force to be much more effective than it would otherwise. So that's the technological side of this contest. But then you get into the asymmetrical standpoint. You know, who is fighting for what reason? 
So if you're fighting a war of survival and it's your homeland at stake, maybe you're better able to absorb the risk or absorb the losses. Where if you're the aggressor and it's purely for territorial expansion uh, or because your leadership you know, feels that this is something that it wants to do, uh, maybe that generates uh, more of a domestic discord or pushback unless the society itself thinks that this is the right thing to be they're also wanting or willing to absorb cost right yeah. and and so you know marshall and that assessment would get involved in that your country is having to assess given the size of our military the borders that we have to secure where our shell enemy might be coming from do does poland have the ability to defend its interests you know and if it it doesn't organically or indigenously, can you get assistance from some of your neighbors? You know, to what extent will the United States throw in? Can you leverage intelligence and targeting information uh, from an ally <clears throat> that makes the use of your own equipment more effective than it would be otherwise? And so these trends in warfare seem to tell us that technology is an absolutely critical enabler. But it's also the economic model, the freedom and innovation that comes from a particular societal governance, uh, uh, you know, relationship people themselves throw in and be done, and are they willing to do so? And so just a really quick note here, I know I've been talking for a bit, but on the got to technology, but we've run up a huge national debt. And so funding the military that, that I and others think we should need is becoming increasingly problematic. And then we have this societal component. So the majority of the American society today has little roots in the old war days, you know, grown up in an era of relative peace and prosperity. And if you look at American youth, since we have an all-volunteer military, 77% of American youth aren't even eligible for physical aid, criminal records or substance abuse. I mean, this is an open literature. So if the people who are eligible yeah, so it's the totality of a culture. You have a government and society. So you can have all the advanced technology you want to have, and we've seen that these are really critical enablers to military operations. But if you don't have the financial or the economic wherewithal to have a military of sufficient capacity or size using those technologies, <clears throat> then your capability is too small. And if society at large isn't willing to contribute in some way, then that's also problematic. So again, the American military, very technologically advanced, but what we have found is three quarters of American youth uh, just aren't eligible for service because of uh, physical problems, uh, obesity, substance abuse, or criminal records. So they just don't, without a waiver, they can't uh, even enter military service. And so of the percentage that might be eligible, how many people want to serve in uniform, right? So it's this reluctance by youth, not just in the United States, but in Germany and in Taiwan and Japan. I don't know the situation of Poland, but do you have popular support for these ideas that national defense is important and that serving in the military forces is an honorable, you know, noble sort of thing? Um, because again, you can have the money or not, you can have technology or not, but if the people, if the political social system isn't supportive of that, then it's really hard to make the case that your national defense posture uh, is viewed as credible enough that it deters bad behavior by your opponent. And if your enemy decides to attack you, is, is your military then capable of mounting you know, a vigorous, effective defense? So it's, the, it's, it's, it's everything combined uh, that, that gets us to the point where we want to be on the national security front. Yeah, in, in line in line with what Andrew Marshall was advocating, that it's all about asking proper questions. Uh, you know, we there are many many questions that we uh, that we pose here in Poland, and we still have no answers to some of the questions, including we have not, I have not, my team, other people have not produced proper answers because it's so difficult 
you know, and some of those questions and, and answers also touch upon U.S. interests and U.S. Uh, for the presence. So, for example, do, are we going to have a huge army, which might be, you know, made of conscription? Should we come back to conscription? Uh, should we also include the females in the conscription? Uh, should we uh, remain with the all-volunteer force, but it's highly expensive, and whether we can afford it? Also, should we also have the registered auxiliary troops in terms of Ukrainians that are in numbers here and Belarusians? Uh, it's a highly heated uh, political question that uh, someone may pose. Should we get to, uh, sh should we prepare the force uh, as an auxiliary force for the U.S. Uh, military machine or a self-independent force that can act upon itself under Article Five? Uh, within a you know a, a forward uh, agreement with the United States, what is a proportionate uh, answer to the Russian provocations, Russian military actions, without triggering Article Five, without all this you know gray zone things and hybrid and everything that right. requires the unison unity of the alliance, and it might be not there. Uh, and then C two is ours. Situation awareness is our enablers are ours. You know because United States may be bogged down in the Western Pacific. Who knows? Or maybe right. we should have the you know active defense where we can hit on our own in the yeah. east. You know the, 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 those are seminal questions that we need to answer. They, they are, and, and, it, and a lot of it boils down to proximity of threat and whether people believe that a threat is actually a threat. So, you know, there are paper realities and then there are physical realities. So in the United States, because we're so far away from potential scenes of action, you know, the South China Sea or the reaches of the Indo-Pacific, six or 8,000 miles away from the United States. So here in the U.S., you could think, well, you're pretty well protected. And, you know, China makes a move against somebody in that part of the world. It's so far away. How does it really affect me here at home? Um, you can have the same view from the United States in terms of Europe. There's a problem in Europe. Uh, it's a European problem. Why should the United States get involved? And so if you wanted to move forces from the U.S. to Europe, you know, 3,000, 5,000 miles away, yes, there are Article Five obligations. But if U.S. forces aren't already on the continent, it is a massive effort to get them from the continental yeah. United States exactly. to someplace in Europe. And so if you're going to operate at range, which is what we're talking about, I can send a ship or an airplane to that area, but it has to land someplace. It has to pull into a port. You have to be able to refuel it, uh, rearm it, repair it. You know, the people have to be there. So who is going to host U.S. forces if you want to decide, have a sizable U.S. presence. So I look at what Poland doing, and it is really leading the way in Europe. Um, you know, there are these debates going on about, uh, is there a potential Russian, Belarusian threat coming out of Belarus? You know, do you move the forces you have closer to that border, or do you try to maintain some kind of a space where you could absorb an attack and then reattack in. Where does Kaliningrad come into this? Yeah. If uh, Belarus acted as a conduit to Russia to uh, create a land bridge across Lithuania, is that so important that Poland takes action, right, to try to stop that uh, from occurring? And so these are great debates that you're having within your own society on how do you assess threat? What does that really mean? And how much risk are you willing to tolerate? I, I would posit that in the case of Poland, you can't tolerate so much risk because it's right there at your doorstep. Whereas for the United States, something happens, you know, we can take weeks or months to kind of debate on it. Uh, you know, we're a pretty big country. We've got a lot of economic interests. And so that colors the perceptions in the United States when, again, proximity uh, for an American, what's the price of fuel at the pump? How much does a loaf of bread cost to soar? You know, those are the immediate concerns of so many Americans here in our country. Similar concerns in Poland or Germany or the United Kingdom, but the physicality of these physical military threats are much more proximate there on the European continent than they are here in the U.S. So it, it causes problems for a defense analyst to try to make a compelling case that to hedge against uncertain futures, you know, mitigating this, this problem of risk, you have to make investments, even though you can't guarantee that a particular event will occur at a particular point on the globe at a particular date and time. You just know that these things do happen. And when they do happen, you don't have much time to respond to it. 
Yeah, also there are political uh, constraints given the nature of the collective alliance like NATO and EU presence uh, uh, mm -hmm. politically and impact, you know, and as you well know, in politics, everything is competitive, everything is happening every day, everything is in motion. So it's a very difficult situation also given the, uh, you know, the need for some sort of solidarity and unity of the NATO alliance. So, for example, there are questions asked whether right. we can really have a strategic active defense that in case something starts to happen, and we already react preemptively, maybe, you know, even if we have forces mm -hmm. available. But, you know, our friends and allies might not be happy about it because that might sort of trigger war or something. So a lot of things. And also the United States doesn't have identical interests as Germany and France which uh, was very well right. documented during w the war in Ukraine. So there are many questions here. We are in the midst of the major reshuffle of how we think about the world. And this is why I wanted to ask those questions. And the last question during our conversation, what do you think the uh, when this period of anarchy, when there is no Supreme Court in international affairs, and it comes to arms. Who can defeat who? Who can kill who? And uh, there is no, uh, you know, rules of the road that would be ac widely accepted by, you know, world that cooperates uh, will end as it, you know, has been with, uh, had been with us for like 25, 30 years with the United States primacy. And this, we have a new chapter of great power competition. Regardless of how it ends, I'm not asking you that question. I will ask you, what do you think? How long the spirit of anarchy and arms will last until the new system is created? Well, I think, yeah, I, I think these things are almost driven, almost always driven by some kind of a catastrophic event. Yeah, it, it's just unfortunate. Uh, you know, if you were to talk to your doctor, and let's say you're a little overweight. The doctor says you need to change your dietary habits or stop smoking or don't drink so much or whatever. Uh, people will listen to that. Do they actually change their lifestyle? Probably not. And they have a heart attack, you know, or a stroke or something. And then they find out there's some real danger in, in living a certain way. And then you see, you know, they find religion and change their ways, right? <clears throat> so you and I can talk about the dangers posed by a growing number of nuclear armed states. Um, the desire of Russia to exact revenge for its losses and really claim what it, what it rightfully sees as territory to once more be influential in European politics. So we can talk about those things all day long, <clears throat> but we'll use Germany as an example. They have made a rhetorical case about dramatically increasing defense spending, but how is that actually translated into real world investments? You know, they have a military that their own minister of defense has said is incapable of defending Germany, much less doing, you know, out of area operations, right? They don't have flight hours to the pilots. German youth don't want to join. They don't have any manufacturing base for munitions. Uh, I think they're only, what, 300 Leopard 2 tanks? I, in, I um, think fewer. In yeah, fewer. And, and, and only 100 of those, I think, are operationally available. So you see, you hear the political rhetoric that says that something is important. But then there's the physical reality, right, that, that just cannot be ignored. And yet people want to ignore it because to change behavior usually exacts an economic cost. You know, it's a reduced subsidy or a government-provided benefit. It increases taxes. That means that the government has to change energy policies. You know, these are emotional events. So at least in my read of history, that always comes down to some kind of a crisis that forces people to ignore the political smokescreen uh, that they have enjoyed living behind and grapple with, with the physical realities of the dangers that present to them. I mean, look at the European continent. The people who only only the people the people who seem to be serious about national security are in northern Europe, and by that I mean Poland, uh, the three Baltic states, Norway, Finland, and Sweden. Uh, if you look at Italy or Spain yeah. on the beach, are, I mean, are, are they even involved in this? Right. And, and so they kind of go along their merry way. And there is an aspect of this in, in American politics, political life you know, as well, that until a crisis affects you directly. 
right? That you are a person generally uh, isn't willing to change patterns of behavior. Here in the United States, our southern border, which I'm sure you've been tracking in the news with illegal immigrants coming on uh, across and hundreds of thousands from Mexico and the United States, the drug trade, criminality, that sort of stuff, it's taken very seriously by New Mexico and Texas and Florida and Southern California. But if you live in one of our northern states, you know, this is a distant matter, right? Until all of a sudden buses start showing up and emptying out these immigrants in uh, Martha's Vineyard, uh, you know, New York State or Chicago or someplace. And now it becomes a reality. So I'm just using that as a metaphor or an analogous situation that when we talk about national defense posture, uh, people have to at some point, decide whether this is important enough for their governments to be investing in and then for the taxpayer or the voting citizen uh, that they take it seriously to be make, make it part of their daily conversation. Okay. Thank you for this answer. And the, uh, you have evaded a little bit, but I understand the reasons. I, no, I should, you can read. You can. I, I, can, <laughs> I would behave in the same manner, basically, because what can you <laughs> answer how long this period will last? I would say 15 up to 20 years, which is the inter, you know, ludium inter, interregnum between the new system, new balance of power is created. I hope, yeah, I hope that it well, will be similar. Yeah, that's where I push it. back. I don't think you can, yeah, I don't think you can put a year on it. I think people, I mean, you talk about the Davidson window in the Western Pacific with China. You know, he says, as uh, Admiral Phil Davidson, who was a uh, commander of U.S. Pacific Forces, you know, out that way, that he thought China would move on Taiwan by 2027, I think, is what the date was. But if the Chinese view their own domestic situation, the demographic crisis, uh, they look at the rearming of Japan, maybe they move sooner than that, right? Maybe, maybe, but maybe they never get their act together, and and a war over Taiwan, you know, never happens. So I'm just leery of kind of predicting the future. Sure. I look at the behavior of peoples now, and the uh, you know two years ago we wouldn't have been talking about a war in Ukraine. Everybody yeah. just kind of dismissed that. True. Sure. Yeah, you know, and then yeah, sure. six months after that two year window, you know, all of a sudden we find ourselves uh, yeah. you know on the edge of desperate measures. True. Sure. True. Sure. Thank you very much for the conversation. Uh, our guest today was Dakota Wood from Heritage Foundation. Thank you very much, Dakota, and I hope you will accept our invitation. Uh, at least one more time or even more times in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Enjoy this. Thank you. Thanks. And you stay with us for more programs and podcasts. Thank you very much. Jacek Bartaszek was uh, your uh, host today.